Thank you, Jesus. This has been really, really good. Really, really good. I, I just feel like this weekend, and it's not over yet, it's just been a weekend of healing and things being unlocked in us to see who we truly are, open the potential that's already there. I just feel like, I feel like it's like all this rubble and rock and there's we're all those diamonds that are underneath it and we don't have to wait to be crushed to be that diamond. We're already that diamond. We just have to stand up out of the rubble and be that diamond that we are. And I think this weekend is just rubbing off all that dirt. Like, you're good. <laughs> it's so good. This has been good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. I think it's been good because Chris got some major revelation. <laughs> he was having a conversation last night with somebody, and I was like, dude keep talking. <laughs> this guy, I was like, you're saying everything that I've been trying to say, but it wasn't penetrating. <laughs> I was like, there's been nobody home for years. <laughs> and Chris was like, dude, you were so here for me. And I'm like, no, dude, you were like here for me. <laughs> it was so cool. <clears throat> Yeah. Chris is growing, guys. Just stay tuned. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about how Chris is so great because he got mad and he didn't want me to. <sighs> so I'm not going to go there. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to say how you have a fit if we don't talk about you. <clears throat> I'm not. That's over with. That ship has sailed now. Chris, Chris, Chris yeah. Because he's crying. Stop, Jim. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. You see his eyes look red. It's because he was crying. I was like, dude, <laughs> grow up. <laughs> okay. This has been a great weekend, guys. <laughs> been a great weekend. Um, yesterday was awesome. Like... Dub, that was great. That stuff that we all know, but you put it in s yeah. such simple form, I was like, I could do this. <laughs> I got this, guys. Who wants a word? I got this. <laughs> yes. That was so good. I think that one of the things that I learned from um, what I'm learning from Dub and from the school is hearing a lot of the stuff that was coming our way I was like, man, this does not filter well through all the filters that I've already had. <laughs> like, like, all the religious filters, I'm like, I don't know about this guy. Like, is this wrong? <laughs> this, this is shaking my core a little bit, which is what it needed. Um, so, yeah, it's been good. Dude, it's been good. <sighs> Announcements, they're up there. I don't have a list. They're not up there. They will be up there. You didn't tell them to put the announcements? That's on Chris. It's all right. It's fine. So. <laughs> it's not my job anymore. Shh. Quiet. No. I have the mic. <laughs> Just kidding. They will be up there. If not today, then come back Sunday. They'll be up there for sure. <laughs> we will see to it. Um, yeah. That's, that's what I got. <laughs> Here's Chris. <laughs> I got to pick on you now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what have we done, man? <laughs> we have unleashed the beast. <laughs> yeah. I'm just nervous. That's all. I just get really nervous. So it helps me to make fun of Chris. Because <laughs> I feel better. Yeah. Oh, you feel better? I feel better, yeah. Yeah. It, it re this reminds me of the first 15 years of marriage where I was emasculated and broke down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So we still got some unlocking? <laughs> no, we're just kidding. We're just kidding. Just jokes. These are the jokes. Just guys. jokes, yeah. yeah. Serious. Come back, Holy Spirit. Yeah. No, um, <clears throat> man, 
It's, it's been really good. I, like everything Raquel said times 10. Um, and, and really, we couldn't be grateful enough. One, for stepping in where we've, where we've come, right? As a church, any of y'all that have been here for any length of time in the la- or been beyond the last two years, like you know where we come from, right? Yeah. Angela, yeah. come on, sister. Off for truth. And uh, so it's amazing that we can still continue to step in, you know, and continue to upgrade our, our not just our life, but our identity is, it, and we're not even, you're not upgrading your identity as much as you're upgrading your understanding of your identity because you're perfect. Your identity, your nature, you're perfect, period. That's it. Your new creation, prototype, there's only one like me. And Raquel says, thank God for that. This is the money maker right here. Hey. That's an inside joke, sorry. We're on, we're on TV. Hey, look over there. We're on TV. And you're saying that on TV. Man, we're on the YouTubes, like my dad says. <laughs> okay. So we really just are thankful for everybody coming out. Um, so today, man, Dub, you just have at it. We're not, it, look, if, if it gets late and you got to go, Dub will go like 16 hours. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if it gets too long and you got to leave, we won't throw rocks at you, we promise. Uh, <laughs> but um, I do want to mention that, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, that, you know, we really, uh, honor is the currency of the kingdom. Amen? That's how God operates. That's the value system is honor. And uh, so I just want to encourage you. Uh, you know, we talk about sowing and reaping uh, now. We've, we've, we look at investing in decor, right? Um, and investing in what's doing well it, it costs dub money to come down here he drove he drove in from amarillo in the desert the hole in the ground right and uh no <laughs> well he was talking about it flat what did you say flat golden and uh, yeah yeah anyway point is it cost him to come down here but he came just to put value in us. So I would really highly encourage you to just ask the Lord and, and look at investing at sowing into him. Uh, we have our app that Sarah can help you with about giving to our guest speaker. I think it's special guest. Sarah's back there talking, so I guess she's not listening. But is it, is it, no, is it special guest or, or special guest? Yeah, guest speaker. So I'm <laughs> just kidding, Sarah. Uh, so if you, man, just, just ask the Lord, and, and then I would say take a, take a chance, right? That's, I mean, if you're going to invest, how many of y'all invest in stocks or mutual funds or crypto? Where's John? Yeah, man, we're on the Bitcoin train. So why not invest in someone that brings complete value, not a gamble? Make sense? Yeah, like there's no gamble here with this guy, right? There's no gamble. He loves us. He brings value. So let's bless him today. Let's be able to send him off, you know, make his eyes go, whoa. All right? <laughs> yeah, we bless him. Yeah. So, man, Father, we just thank you for what all you're doing, and we, we just ask for our ears, our understanding, our insight, and our capacity to increase today as Dub just brings the heavy revy in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, Dub. Let's give him a hand clap. Amen. Awesome, awesome. Heavy Revy was my rapper name back in the day. That's not true. <laughs> I made that up. It was funny, though. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like you should be rating my jokes, like 5.3. <laughs> Hold it up. <laughs> That's awesome. Not today. Not today. Thanks, though. I usually do use the whiteboard, but, uh, yeah, going to go a different direction today. Man, uh, Wow, that was some of the most anointed worship I've been in and around in a long, long time. So, mad props to everybody. Give the worship team a hand. That was so good. <laughs> Whoo, man. Had some encounters during that. That was great. Uh, and, man, while we're at it, let's give the tech team a hand, right? The unsung heroes. Making it sound good, making it look good. Providing the resources to make it repurposable or the YouTubes on the line, all that. So, uh, 
Man, it's good to be with you guys. Um, you guys have such a unique blend of all the best parts of revival culture and all of the intentionality of Reformation culture, and I really appreciate that and really like that. You've got to have that uh, in order to change the world, and that's the plan, right? Have you ever noticed how in Acts that the believers of the first church were known as the people that turned the world upside down? That's pretty awesome, right? And so we should be those people now today, right? Have you ever wondered how did the first church explode and just grow and, and multitudes of people, uh, their numbers just doubled and tripled every day? And yet now it's like we've got to get together and have some sort of evangelism training course because we've got to convince people into the gospel. So there must be an issue there. There must be a difference between what was being presented to people 2,000 years ago and what's being presented today. Does that make sense? And a lot of that has to do with the deterioration of theology throughout the years. Because there's been influential, quote-unquote, theologians that have presented terrible theories and ideas that malign the nature, the attributes of God, that have shifted the uh, focus of the gospel from the gospel of the kingdom into simply and only just the gospel of salvation, and then has put that into a, a whole paradigm that is all about somebody's got to get judged and somebody's got to pay for this. Whereas if you get back to the theology of the first church, sin was 100% of the time looked at as a disease that the great physician came to remove from his people. It was all about the grace and the mercy of God redeeming his sons and daughters back into himself. Not who's going to pay for the wrong that you did. You know, when you employ sin, the wages of sin is death. So when you sin, you are inviting death into your life. And where does death put you? In the grave, right? Sin, death, grave. That's what owned you. And Jesus came and his blood purchased you from that system. And when he owned you and your sin, then he just forgave it. Because that's his nature. He's a forgiving God. He's actually not looking, come on, he's not looking for payment for your sin. He's looking for the opportunity to forgive your sin. That's what he's looking for. There was a financial exchange that took place on the cross, but the payment of Jesus' perfect, holy, righteous blood didn't go to pay off Father. Because he's not the Godfather, he's the good Father. All right, I'm going to leave on that note. That was a high note. I don't know. <laughs> right? And so, seven. That's it? Dang. All right. That's fine. I'm fine. It's fine. So, so the payoff went to purchase you from the system that you were a part of and a slave to. And he's, you've been redeemed into freedom, into God. And so I love theology. I love identity. And um, one of the parts of my identity, because the kingdom is familial in nature and it's governmental in structure, so you have a part of your identity that has to do with the family relationship. Who does he call you as a son? Who does he call you as a daughter? And then you have a governmental title, right? You're a citizen of the kingdom and you are an ambassador of Christ Jesus, okay? So what are you an ambassador of? What is the level of authority that you walk in? You walk in power because you're a part of the family, you walk in authority because you're a part of the government. Does that make sense? There's a difference. So the church has focused on the family piece and the power piece, and that's why we have houses of power where people can come and experience a touch from the Lord, but we're not exhibiting or demonstrating authority in culture. And that's the issue, because we've missed the governmental aspect of the kingdom. And I love bringing that piece out. Uh, so the governmental name that I have that God has given me is he calls me Kingdom Connection. 
I am the ambassador of Kingdom Connection. I connect people to the kingdom. I connect government officials to the strategies of the kingdom. If I'm doing identity sessions with people, I'm connecting them to their kingdom identity. Everything that I do is about connection. But when it comes to being his son, he calls me his favored son. And so I walk in a ridiculous amount of favor in so much that uh, I have one story where I went to a nation, didn't know anybody, had no plans, and ended up with the president of that nation right? So that's like the type of favor that I walk in, but I've also, once I recognized it, I began to intentionally apply my faith to partner with my favor. Because when you begin to do with intention what you have done through intuition, you will achieve acceleration. And so I want to equip you with a tool that I like to call favor expectation. Favor expectation. You actually need to expect to encounter favor every day of your life. And so we're going to break down what favor is, and we're going to look at how it works, how it should play out in your life. And at the end, I'm going to release an impartation of favor over you guys. Because if you are going to change the world, not only did Acts call the first church the people that changed the world, it also says that they found favor with all men. What? That wasn't the gospel I grew up with. Well, brother, now that you're a believer, you should really expect persecution. You should just really lean into that. You're not really making a difference until, you know, well, what about the favor piece? Because for a long time, the church found favor with all men until the, uh, the old covenant Jews and then Nero and the Romans picked them as a target, right? And then the persecution started. Okay, but what about the favor piece when they were known as the world changers? Because that's the place I want to live in. Trust me, I get my uh, my level of persecution into. I'm fine. Okay, (laughs) I'm not saying everything is awesome, but sometimes it is. So maybe we should expect some awesome times in this journey. Right. So let's talk about favor. Favor. uh, I'm just going to rattle off some scriptures here. Genesis 6, 8. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Esther 2.17. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women. She won his favor. 1 Samuel 2.26. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. Oh, so you can grow in favor with the Lord and people. Daniel chapter 1, verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Luke 2.52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. So if you are as he is, and Jesus went through a process of growing in favor with God and with man, then it stands to reason that that process is available to you, that you have the ability to grow in favor. All right. Would you also agree with me that all of the biblical characters that I listed off there, that they are all world changers, that they had an impact on the history of the world that is still being felt today? And favor is one of those inextricable threads that runs through all of these characters' stories. So it's worth paying attention to. So the working definition that I want to use for favor today is that favor is unexplainable, unearned, undeniable, preferential treatment. (laughs) I'll say that again. Favor is unexplainable. You can't explain it. Unearned. Jesus purchased it for you undeniable, when you start walking in it, people can't deny what's happening, preferential treatment. And God uses this favor to put you where you need to be, when you need to be there, with who you need to be with in order to accomplish what it is that he wants you to do. That's the purpose of this supernatural grace that God is wanting you to grow in and to pour out on your life. He wants you to be in the right place at the right time with the right people in order to advance the kingdom. He's for you, and he's for your purpose. He created you for purpose, on purpose. And he wants to partner with you in changing the world. I'm so serious about this. <laughs> like, he really wants to, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He wants all of the world reconciled to him. I don't know about you, but I was taught that God was mad at the world. The gospel that I was handed was God is so mad about sin that he murdered his only son. I know. It's like an extreme, uh, an extreme mistranslation of John 3.16. God so loved the world 
that he sent his only son to redeem all of the world back to him. And now we are the body of Christ, right? It's so interesting that Jesus' spirit, Holy Spirit, dwells in your body. And you are seated with him in heavenly places, meaning that your spirit is bilocational and your spirit lives in the body of Jesus in heaven. That's crazy. Right? You know, Jesus took his body with him to heaven. He still has a physical form there. And your spirit is in him. And his spirit is in your body. That's abidance. You are inseparably entangled with God. You know, you can't actually draw near to God. Yeah. How are you going to? He's in you. You are in him. How can you get any closer? It's not possible. What phrases like that mean in songs is shift your awareness to the reality and the truth that currently exists, right? We probably need to write some new songs, right? (laughs) I don't think y'all did it this weekend, so, uh, you know that song, uh, um, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here, right? Come Holy Spirit. He's like, I've been here. (laughs) I was actually waiting on y'all this morning, but... (laughs) It's all good. That's a great song. I've had great encounters during that song because it helps us shift our awareness to the reality. But you're in him. He's in you. You can't get any closer, right? Well, I, f- I, really, I really feel separated from the Lord. Well, you should quit agreeing with that lie, with that illusion. <laughs> He's in your face. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. I don't even know how I got there. Let's get back to favor. Oh, because God's like down with the world. He loves the world, right? He wants to redeem all the world to himself, and he's going to do that through you. You are the body of Christ. You are the extension of the heart and the authority of God from the unseen realm into the seen realm. You are the kingdom. When you show up, the kingdom shows up. All right. And I want to equip you with favor, the understanding and an impartation of favor at a higher level this morning, so that you find yourself more and more of the time walking in convergence. What is convergence? Convergence is when you are walking in the fullness of your identity and your purpose. And you find yourself the majority of your time at the right place at the right time with the right people in order to accomplish what it is that God wants you to do. All of you have significant emotional events in your life that you remember feeling the most alive. Oh, that was one of the best moments of my life. What is happening in that moment is you have accidentally stumbled upon a point of convergence where everything that you were made to be, everything that you are, and everything that you were called to do is all lining up for a moment. And so you feel the most alive. Why? Because the most of you is fully engaged in that moment. But the cool thing is, is that you can identify that and then choose to live in that place. That's pretty awesome. That's why getting clarity on your identity and purpose is so paramount. So that you can just walk in purpose in the fullness of your identity all the time. And life is super good when you do that. All right, so I believe we're going to focus in on the story of Joseph first for the first two hours. And uh, (laughs) there's no story that I believe personifies the principle of favor more than the story of Joseph. So we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 37. We're going to skip through three chapters in Genesis. So just follow with me. Uh, follow the sound of my voice. This would have been terrible for uh, the person running the screen to have to try and follow me, so I've spared them that this morning. It says in Genesis chapter 37, verse 3, Now Israel, whose name was changed to Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him, or many of us would have grown up hearing the story of the coat of many colors. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word about him. So they ended up throwing him in a pit. They want to kill him, but instead they decide just to sell him. Verse 28, so when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. After he arrives in Egypt, he's sold to a man named Potiphar, who is the captain of Pharaoh's guard, chapter 39, verse 4. But Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. 
Potiphar put him in charge of his whole household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And from the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian because of Joseph, and the blessing of the Lord was on everything that Potiphar had, both in house and field. Now after this, Potiphar's wife tries to get Joseph to sleep with her. He won't. She gets angry, tells Potiphar Joseph tried to rape her. Joseph gets thrown in prison, and so he went from his father's place to the pit, from the pit to Potiphar's house, and from Potiphar's house to prison. Are you with me? In prison, he meets a couple of guys who work for Pharaoh, and he ends up interpreting their dreams. And one of them gets out, goes back to work for Pharaoh, ends up overhearing Pharaoh say that he has had a dream that is troubling him. He remembers Joseph, tells Pharaoh about him. Joseph ends up interpreting Pharaoh's dream and telling him there's going to be seven years of abundance, then seven years of famine in the land. And Pharaoh receives this, chapter 41, verse 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. You know, if you want to become an influential person, be the person that solves problems. Not the person that points out problems. Some people only develop to that point, and they're super irritating. <laughs> they, they can point out all the problems all the time. Thank you. Do you have any solutions? Oh, no, I just thought you should be aware that there's this, this problem over here. Well, thank you. Oh, my goodness. So he went from the pit to Potiphar's house, from Potiphar's house to prison, and from the prison to the palace. Chapter 41, verse 47. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food put it, produced and put it in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up a huge quantity of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, the seven years of famine began, and just as Joseph had said, there was a famine in all the other lands, but the whole land of Egypt had food. Chapter 42, verse 3, then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, the same brothers that sold him into slavery to the Ishmaelites. Chapter 45, verse 3, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were unable to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God has sent me here ahead of you. So, favor. The Bible is clear that Joseph's story begins with favor. It begins by saying that Joseph's father, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of the other brothers. Joseph was favored by their father. Joseph was favored by the father, but he was hated by his brothers, which teaches us something powerful about favor, and that is this. Not everyone has to like you as long as the right one does. That will set some of you free because some of you are not moving in the fullness of your identity and your purpose because you're worried some people won't like you. Guess what? Some people already don't like you. <laughs> so you might as well add to that list and walk out your purpose, right? Not everybody has to like you as long as the right one does. The brothers hated Joseph, but the father favored Joseph. And the father favored Joseph so much that in verse 3, his father makes for Joseph a coat of many colors. Verse 4 is curious because it states this, when the brothers saw the coat, when they saw that the father loved Joseph more than any of them, they hated him and would not speak a kind word to him. They saw the favor on his life. They saw that the father loved him more than them, and they hated him. What did they see? They saw a coat. Joseph's father's favor manifested tangibly in a coat, which means when favor becomes tangible in your life, some people are going to become feisty. When favor became tangible, the brothers became hostile. Verse 3, the father gives him the coat. Verse 4, when the brothers saw that there was favor on his life, what did they see? They saw the coat. You see, they could handle him being favored as long as he didn't wear it. But when he started wearing favor, when he started looking like he was favored, when favor became evident in his life, you see, it's one thing for people to hear us talk about favor. It's another thing for people to see favor manifest tangibly 
in your life. The manifestation of Joseph's favor unearthed self-esteem issues in his brothers. And some people are saying, Lord, give me favor. And God's saying, I'd like to give you some favor, but you have to be aware that feistiness comes with favor. When you get favor, people get feisty because there are certain people who can only handle your success at a certain level. And you don't know they have esteem issues because you've never been at a place where they felt threatened by you. Now, all of a sudden, some things start happening for you. You start getting around the right people at the right time, at the right place. Things start happening for you. And they start getting feisty and aggressive. And you're like, where did this come from? It's always been there, but now you're wearing a coat that you didn't have before. But if you've got a problem with my coat, you've got to take that up between you and God. Because if he's going to give it to me, I'm going to wear it. If he's going to open the door, I'm going to walk through it. If he's going to make the connection, I'm going to shake the hand. If he's going to extend the invitation, I'm going to show up. Because it's not my fault that I got favor. <laughs> you should say that over yourself right now. It ain't my fault that I got favor. <laughs> You're wondering why I'm blessed? I'm wondering why I'm blessed, honestly. You're wondering why I get opportunities? I'm wondering why I got opportunities. But I do know that I have favor. Come on. You see, the brothers can't understand because Joseph is younger than they are. So the brothers are thinking, we've been around longer. We've worked harder. We have more tenure than you. Why is it we have tenure and you've got favor? But that's what favor does. Favor will leap over people who have been there longer in order to get to you what God says is for you. But when you experience favor, you've got to be ready to deal with feisty people because favor evokes feistiness. When you get favor, you become a target. It's like this platform and this microphone. You can't have the platform and the microphone without the bullseye that comes with it. <laughs> I get emails and messages all the time. Brother, I'm uh, just concerned. I listened to this message, and uh, there was a real check in my spirit. <laughs> you know, I'm like, send it to my email, dubdoesntcare.com. I'll get back to you when I check that never. Just playing. To be clear, I have people that I'm walking with in relationships, spiritual brothers, fathers, mothers, that I am accountable to, all right? But some rando that messages me <laughs> to check me on my hair say I don't have time for that. So that's what I'm trying to express there. But, but listen, you can't have favor without the bullseye that comes with it. So what God will do is he will favor you to the extent that you can tolerate pain. He will favor you to the degree that you can tolerate pain. He says, listen, if you have to be liked all the time, that's going to put a limit on the amount of favor I can give you. If you're not a person who can stomach, listen to me, being disliked for no reason, that's going to put a limit on the amount of favor that he's able to give you. You see, God's not stingy about favor, but he's wise about it. He doesn't want to break you. He, doesn't, he can put so much favor on your life, it would ruin your life. So he's like, how much favor can I give you? How much do you want? You need to be aware of what comes with favor. Not everybody is going to like you. And some people are going to hate you for no reason. And that's unjust. Let them hate. That's it. They're sipping on that haterade. <laughs> oh, my. a 10. Yes. All right. <laughs> So you have to have the strength of personality, the emotional fortitude to not allow the jealousy of the brothers to rob you of the joy of the coat. God will favor you to the degree that you can tolerate pain in that area. Joseph's story not only teaches us about feistiness, it also teaches us about being forsaken and forsaking because favor comes with forsakenness. Joseph's story causes the brothers, they get so upset, they want to take his life, but instead they put him in a big pit, they see merchants coming, and they say, let's sell him to these people. They can take him to Egypt. They are forsaking him. They are leaving him out to dry. But this happens with favor because favor will send you places that your company can't go. I'll say that again. Favor is going to send you some places that your current company cannot go with you. So if you're not willing to change circles in certain areas, that's going to limit the amount of favor you can have because favor puts you in a different circle. And God says, listen, I love them, but I did not invite them to this circle. 
I invited you. I didn't call them. Now you are trying to bring them into that circle with you, and they're not carrying the grace for that assignment in that circle, and now they are messing it up for you. They're saying things that they shouldn't say. They're doing things they shouldn't do. And it's because you overextended love and compassion and relationship, and you brought somebody with you who wasn't ready to go with you. (laughs) For those of you who were here yesterday, we were talking about how do you prophesy covertly with influential people in the secular world, and you have to take the Christianese out of it. I told you about that guy. (laughs) We're both standing with a government official, and he's like, the Lord really wants to birth something through you, sir. And this guy is not from our stream, and he's never heard that before, and he looks at him like he had three heads. Because he's a dude that just got told that some supernatural being wanted to birth something through him, right? And that did not land well, okay? (laughs) And it's because that guy was a church prophet, not a government prophet. He He got into the wrong circle that he wasn't prepped for, and it blew up, and it wasn't good, and he was not invited back. You know, I didn't even read it, but it says that when Pharaoh called for Joseph, that Joseph shaved his face, which was against Hebrew custom, and changed his raiment and went in to talk to Pharaoh. You've got to know how to prepare yourself for the influencer that God is going to put you with. Because you're the answer to that, that that influencer is looking for. You're the solution, right? But you've got to know how to move in that circle. I'm down with, with church, Right? And I could prophesy in church, but I understand the shift that has to be made when I'm prophesying in government. I know how to present myself differently, right? Yesterday I had shorts on, right? <laughs> but today, but when I'm in front of a government official, I have a three-piece suit on with cufflinks, bling, okay? <laughs> you got to know how to show up where and when. You got to know, all right? Favor will send you places your company can't go. All right. If you are unwilling to change your circle, if you're unwilling to forsake some relationships, that's going to limit the amount of favor that you can have. You see, Joseph's purpose is tied to Egypt. So what God has to do is God has to put Joseph in a position to get him out of the land because otherwise he's not going to leave. You realize Joseph had a lot of brothers, 10 of them that are out working in the field, And he's hanging out in the house playing Call of Duty on dad's big screen, right? Because he's the favored brother. You think he's going to leave that and go to Egypt? Negative. (laughs) He's going to stay right there. So God didn't cause the brothers to throw him in a pit and sell him, but he used it. He implemented favor. He put the grace of favor on those events in order to get Joseph where Joseph needed to be with who he needed to be with when he needed to be there in order to save nations from a global famine. And God's looking to do the same thing for you. You see, Joseph may have heard God calling, but he was so emotionally connected to his family that God had to stir the nest in order to get him out of there and over to the place where he was supposed to be. You see, some of you have had relationships that ended badly for you. And you really thought that they broke up with you, and you didn't realize that God sent them away from you. Because they couldn't have handled the purpose and the destiny that you have on your life. They actually would have held you back. (laughs) Some firings, not all. (laughs) Some firings are God's way of stirring the nest. Because if he doesn't help you leave, you won't leave. So I'm I'm a young man, and... I'm a worship leader, and I'm, I've been married for two years, and we land, you know, I land my first full-time worship leading job at a church and in the Panhandle area, and, uh, you know, it's like got the state-of-the-art sound system and, like, the fog machine and the lights and the in-ear monitors, and, and the band is, like, super on point, and everything's amazing, and we go and buy a house, and I remember vividly uh, I'm mowing the lawn on our first house, right? And uh, I remember thinking, I'm going to retire from this bad boy. <laughs> I was done. Like, I was locked in. I had, like, all the, all the comfort. Uh, and then uh, I got fired, like, uh, about a year later. An unrighteous firing, for the record, all right? Uh, but how many of you know that that's not what I was made for? Right? I would never be working in the UN and prophesying covertly over presidents of nations 
if I hadn't gotten fired, I would be mowing my lawn, right? <laughs> and thinking about uh, what new piece of sound equipment I was going to purchase with the church's enormous budget the next year, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, listen, oh, I, I feel like I'm supposed to share this story. When I caught the kingdom, like, the Amarillo area is Bible Belt, okay? So, like, every little town you go into, there's the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Church of Christ, the uh, Catholic Church, the Assembly of God, right? And uh, so I start getting the kingdom. I start sharing the kingdom. And, like, so now I'm like the cult in town, right? He preaches a different gospel, right? And so I'm, like, trying to find, like, where are the other kingdom people at? You know what I mean? And so I found, like, the Chris Valentin podcast, Bill Johnson. I start listening to those podcasts. I'm like, well, this is amazing. And so I, I go to Bethel twice, and, like, I connect easily. I am kingdom connection. Like, I relationally connect easily. I go to Bethel twice, zero connection, no favor. I can't connect with anybody. I'm like, what's happening? Like, I'm, like, super down in the dumps about it. Uh, two years later, I meet Dan McCollum. He invites me to come to the mission I go to the mission and connect with everybody. It's like amazing. And it's really because the mission has a reformational culture, and that's what I'm made for. I'm made to progress and advance that, whereas Bethel has the revival culture, right? They're like the king of the revival space, right? And so I'm talking to the Lord about that. It's starting to click. Oh, if I had been accepted at Bethel on the same level I was accepted at the mission, I never would have found really my tribe. I would have been trying to fit into the revival box, rather than moving freely in the reformational box, and God said, yes. He said, that what you perceived as rejection was really my protection for a future connection. Because he speaks to me in rap. And so, uh, <laughs> so some of you need to reframe some rejections that you've experienced in your life and realize, oh, that was actually favor at work. I thought I wanted that connection, and the Lord didn't allow that to happen because it was protection for a future connection, a better connection that he has for me. All right, so favor comes with feistiness. Favor comes with forsaking. So if you're going to walk in favor, and trust me, you want to because it puts you where you need to be, when you need to be there, with who you need to be with in order to accomplish what it is that he wants you to do then you also have to understand that favor will do something else that you might not expect. It says that they put him in the pit. 39 verse 1, the Ishmaelites picked him up to take him to the big market in Egypt. Joseph's purpose is in Egypt. Egypt is Joseph's right place. Who takes Joseph there? The Ishmaelites. And who are the Ishmaelites? The Ishmaelites exist because of Joseph's great-grandfather's mistake. You catch that? So you have to understand that favor will use past failure as a vehicle to carry you into your purpose. Favor will use your past failures and the past failures of your lineage. The past failures of your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents. God says, I'll take all that and use that to transport you where you need to go. Because the enemy uses past failure to torment you. The kingdom uses past failure to transport you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yes. You've got to look at the Ishmaels in your life and your parents' life and your grandparents' life, all of the past failures, and say, God, make me aware of how you are redeeming those failures and actually working them for my good. Because you can't lose in the kingdom. You just can't. Because you are existing from the victory of Jesus. You live from victory. We advance the kingdom from victory. Right? You don't work for the pleasure of God. You exist because you are the pleasure of God. It pleased him to make you. That was for free. <laughs> Whatever is meant for evil, God is going to work for good, which tells us that if it ain't good yet, he ain't done yet. So we should reframe things into that paradigm. Joseph gets to Egypt. He's promoted to Pharaoh's house. A famine comes into his homeland. His fathers are sent. His father sent his brothers looking for food. Guess who's in charge of the food? Joseph. So the same brothers who put him in the pit are the same brothers that are now coming and petitioning him for food. 
And they think Joseph is going to be mad at them, but Joseph says, listen, I'm too blessed to be upset. What you meant for evil, God has taken and used for good. Joseph says, if you hadn't hurt me then, I couldn't help you now. Wow. That's what favor is for. Genesis 45, don't be distressed with me. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here. It was to save lives that God sent me here ahead of you. God did this. God was behind all of it. He didn't cause it all, but he used it all. From his father's place to the pit, from the pit to Potiphar's house, from Potiphar's house to prison, from prison to the palace where he fulfilled his purpose, the whole time favor walking by his side, making sure that he was where he needed to be, with who he needed to be with, when he needed to be there so that he could do what God wanted him to do. And each step was actually a promotion. Because in the pit, Joseph learned how to manage himself because there was nothing else in the pit. <laughs> He went into the pit an arrogant young man, but he came out with some wisdom and some humility. So in the pit, he learned how to manage himself. In Potiphar's house, he learned how to manage things. Potiphar put him in charge of all that he owned and everything that he touched prospered. And then he went to prison, which sounds like a demotion until you learn that he learned how to manage people in prison, which is actually a promotion. In the pit, he learned to manage himself. In Potiphar's house, he learned to manage things. In prison, he learned how to manage people. And in the palace, he learned how to manage his purpose, which benefited a nation and surrounding nations. And the same process is available to you, only there are things that you can inherit instead of earn. Everything in the world, you either earn it or you inherit it. And inheriting it is way easier. So just choose to do that. Right? How many of you have earned some wisdom? Right? How many of you have finally gotten to the point where you're like, oh, that person is wiser than me. I should just go and inherit this next piece. Right? And that's so much better. Right? I will inherit all the wisdom I can because I've earned a lot of it and it wasn't fun. So you've got to, be, you've got to have the fortitude to move forward through the feistiness, the forsakenness, and the failures, knowing that favor is working upon your behalf. Let me tell you how the story ends in Genesis 41, verse 51. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and says, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble in all my father's household. And the second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Ah, so favor will cause you to forget the struggles the pain, all of that. And favor will cause you to be fruitful even in the land of your suffering. How does this happen? Through favor. All right, I'm going to keep going. We're going to take a look at Ruth here. If you have to get going, no worries. But I'm gonna, I feel there's a lot of hunger in the room, so I'm going to keep going. So I want to go to the second definition or an added new definition of favor, and that is this, that favor is your personal assistant who is on God's payroll that God has commissioned to work on your behalf and it is working for you even when you don't know it's working. I'll say that again. Favor is your personal assistant who is on God's payroll that God has commissioned to work on your behalf and is working for you even when you don't know it's working. Favor is working for you even when you don't know it's working. When you're asleep, favor is at work in your life. When you're worrying, favor is at work in your life. When you're working, favor is working as a multiplier in your life to advance you, to put you where you need to be, when you need to be there with who you need to be with in order to accomplish what it is that God has created you to do. And the price for this unearned preferential treatment was paid in full by Jesus on the cross. Grace is a gift that is extended to those who have the faith to believe that it exists. I got to say that again. Grace is a gift that is extended to those who have the faith to believe that it exists. And favor is a type of grace. So favor is in existence. And it is, you have an invitation. It is extended to you. And all you have to do is have the faith to believe that it exists. How do you get the faith to believe that it exists? You exercise your free will and you choose to believe that it exists. And you intentionally decide to begin to expect it, right? That's the easiest, easiest, like, practical way. How do I engage faith? You expect something. Everybody engages faith, but a lot of people do it with worry. 
They expect something bad to happen. What are they doing? They are exercising faith towards fear. So what happens if you choose to expect, if you choose to exercise your faith towards favor? Wake up in the morning. You know what? I'm going to choose to expect that I'm going to have a divine encounter today. That at some point, I'm going to find myself exactly where I need to be, with who I need to be with, when I need to be there, in a way that advances my purpose. Favor expectancy. It's a huge key. When did I learn this? Um, so I was on, uh, so this is not a political statement. I'm neither Democrat nor Republican. I'm kingdom. I'll sit down with a government official on either side of the aisle because I'm actually not for politics. I'm for government. There's a difference. Politics is the nasty game that is played on the field of government. Okay? So I'll sit down with anybody because I might be the, the I, I, I am planning on being their encounter with the goodness of God that will change the way that they think, right? So I got selected to be on Trump's uh, diversity coalition during his first campaign. And the way that that happened was, uh, and to frame this, I grew up in South Oak Cliff, which is inner city Dallas. We were the only white family, right? And so with that in mind, I get picked to be on the diversity coalition because they formed the coalition and then they realized there weren't any white people on it. <laughs> so they call me, I'm the token white guy. I'm like, I've trained for this my whole life. I will get on the plane. I will be there. All right. So I get on the plane. Uh, me and my wife, we're flying to Trump Towers and uh, we're going to uh, meet and, and do some stuff. And I'm just thanking the Lord, you know, because I know that my Metron is government and really my Metron is global government. I'm way more effective in global government than I am in federal government. But this is like cool because I love my nation and oh, I'm getting to speak into something. So that's cool. So I'm just sitting there. and I'm thanking the Lord. And uh, he asks me, he says, uh, what else do you want? And I was like, I was just thanking you for this. This is, this is cool, you know? And he was like, what else do you want? And I was like, well, so I had seen that Lance Wallnow was going to be in New York at the same time. And I've learned a lot from Lance, especially old school Lance. I love, he was like, is like the mad scientist of the kingdom, right? And uh, that's where I get my whiteboard grace. And uh, so I was like, well, I'd like to meet Lance. And uh, he said, get down your journal and write out what you will say to Lance when you meet him. So I, I stood up, got in my overhead and uh, carry on, got my journal out. And I just wrote, you know, just like a, a real simple honoring statement to Lance. And so uh, my wife and I, we get to Trump Towers. And um, if any of y'all have ever been there when you've uh, toured New York or whatnot. And so there's media trucks everywhere. There's only 60 of us on the Diversity Coalition but there's like 100 media people in there. And so we get into the lobby, and it's super packed and crowded and stuffy. And so I kind of edge my way out of the crowd towards the back of Trump Towers. And I look over my shoulder, and through the back entrance, here comes Lance Wall now. And he's like, he's on Periscope, right? Because he's like always oh, like <laughs> streaming stuff. He walks right up to me. He's never met me. Walks right up to me. Hey, what's going on in here, you know? And so uh, live on Periscope, I get to share with him the way that he impacted my life and honor him, you know, for some of the revelation that I got, especially around the Seven Mountain strategy, et cetera. And what I learned in that moment was, oh, if I choose to expect favor and I prepare for favor, favor manifests in my life at a higher level. Favor expectancy. So what are you doing on a daily basis to choose to expect to encounter favor and to prepare for it? So now I have a journal full of words for different celebrities and world leaders and pro athletes that I believe that I'm going to meet someday. And when I meet them, guess what? I'm going to be prepared. And I'm going to have impact in that 30 seconds or five minutes that I have with them. And that's available for you. All right. So let's take a look at Ruth. It says this, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, In the days when the judges ruled... Okay, that's the time. There was a famine in the land. That's the crisis. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, these are the characters, went and lived for a while in the country of Moab. So there's so much just in this first verse. In the days when the judges ruled, so at this time Israel heard from God through the prophets and settled disputes and handled civil government through wise men known as judges. There was a famine in the land. This is an agrarian society, meaning that if it doesn't rain, everybody's going to starve. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, now here's what's interesting. Bethlehem means house of bread. 
So there's a famine in the house of bread, which causes this man to move. And that's a hidden key that if things are not as they should be in a place, sometimes that's God's way of saying it's time for you to move. So, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now, Moab, I know this is a shocker, is the land where the Moabites live. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) That's it. The Moabites are the descendants of Moab, second shocker. Wow, that one didn't go over at all. I should have stopped when I was ahead, too late. Who was a relative of Abraham, all right? So he was like kind of a nephew of Abraham. Now, Moab came from a messed up family, and his descendants had a reputation among the Jews for being uh, idol worshipers and engaging in obscene rituals and practices. So he's going someplace where it is not highly acceptable for him to go. This man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. They went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. In other words, they found good things in bad places. How many of you know that God can drop your blessing anywhere? So you should be looking. And they lived there for 10 years. Both Malon and Kilion died. Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughter-in-laws prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-laws, she left the place where they had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. When Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back home. Each of you to your mother's home, may the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to me and to your dead husbands. And may the Lord grant each of you that you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and wept aloud and, and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight, gave birth to sons, would you wait till they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my Lord. No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept out, wept aloud again, and Orpah said, you right. (laughs) Kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth said, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And isn't that the testimony of all of us in the room that know him? He may have started out as your mother's God. He may have started out as your friend's God. He started out as my grandfather's God. But somewhere along the way, I had a personal experience, and he became my God. Somewhere along the way, you had a personal experience. He became your God. So Ruth, who grew up in a family of idol worshipers, is saying, I've had a taste of what it's like to worship the one true living God, and I can't get enough. Oh, I've experienced some great loss, but he makes it better. Verse 17, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Then Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, and she stopped urging her. So the two women went on till they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, The whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant, she said. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Lord has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. These two verses are huge because if you don't understand what the Lord is doing, if you don't understand how he feels about you, that he loves you as his son or his daughter, that his plan is to give you life and life abundantly, that he promises to work all things for your good, when you don't understand that favor is working behind the scenes, you can very quickly lose grip on your identity. And so Naomi says, don't call me pleasant call me bitter. Naomi didn't understand that the Lord had stopped her by Moab in her life journey to pick up Ruth to bring her back to Bethlehem so that Ruth could fulfill her purpose. You see, sometimes favor will take you to a place that is not for you. It's for the sake of somebody else. So if you are currently dissatisfied with where you are, but you know the Lord has sent you there, perhaps begin to ask the question, who am I here for? Because favor is at work in your life. You are at the right place at the right time with the right people. But what if that favor is 
for you, simply not about you. Naomi said, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. When in reality, although she experienced great loss, she had returned with a woman who God had chosen to be a key player in changing the world. We'll get to that in a moment. Verse 22, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Ruth chapter 2, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone who, in whose eyes I find, you guessed it, favor. Which tells us that if you are going to fulfill your purpose, you have to know who to get behind. You have to figure out who is leaving something for me. Listen, you shouldn't follow me if I'm not leaving something for you. Come on. You've got to know who to get behind. Sometimes provision is missed because you didn't know who to follow. You're getting behind people who aren't leaving anything behind for you. I can't follow you if you're not leaving something for me. You've got to be leaving me some insight, leaving me some wisdom, leaving me some opportunities. I need you to leave me something that's going to help me become everything that God has created me to be. So you should ask yourself, who are you following and what are they leaving for you? Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and entered a field huh, and began to glean or gather behind the harvesters. And as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Limelech. So Ruth steps out in faith, believing that God has something good for her. She is expecting favor. Did you hear it in her declaration? Let me go out and gather behind whoever eyes it is that I find favor. She's expecting to find favor, so what happened? She found it. Favor expectancy. So, as it turns out, she finds herself at the right field, at the right time, with the right people, all of which is essential, as we're about to see, for her completing her purpose. She entered a field, oh, the right field, just then, the right time. Boaz, the right people, arrived from Bethlehem. Now, here's what you need to know about Boaz. Number one, he's Naomi's cousin. Number two, he has a good reputation in the community. Number three, he's wealthy. Number four, he's single. And all the single ladies said amen. <laughs> Number five, he was the only good one out of his brothers. Cheating ass, broke ass, drunk ass. But Boaz had it together. <laughs> Some of y'all will get that on the drive home. It's cool. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Which this is a huge key for anyone who is called to business in the kingdom. You should establish a culture of reciprocal blessing with your employees. Boaz is the man. He's got like a Fortune 500 company, and the first thing he does when he arrives on the scene is he blesses his employees. And what do they do? They bless him back. How many of you know that took some work to establish that culture? That's for free. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, uh, who does that young lady belong to? <laughs> um, hello, who is that? You see, favor will not only put you in the right field, but it will gain you the attention and the affection of the right person. Come on. Favor will make you stand out to the right person, the right person at the company that you work for, the right person at the bank that has the loan that you need, the right person at the school. You may feel like you're often ignored, that no one sees you, that you can't catch a break, but I'm here to tell you this morning that favor will make sure that anyone who is essential to you fulfilling your purpose will notice you. Not only will favor gain you the right person's attention, favor will win you the right person's affection. Because notice that Boaz noticed her and he liked what he saw. And we've got to be careful not to shrink this down to a story about a crush because Boaz wasn't there for company. Bozo can be there for company. That went over pretty good, all right. Boaz was there. I always feel like I'm crafting my Netflix comedy special. I'm like, <laughs> Boaz was there because he was essential to fulfilling Ruth's purpose. Now watch this. The overseer replied, verse 6, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. Now why did he have to double up on the Moab thing there? You notice that? Uh, sir, she is the Moabite 
that came back from Moab with Naomi. In other words, he's like, boss, she's not, she's not on your level. She's not good for you. She said, please let me glean and gather behind, among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Now, you remember all the way back in chapter 1, verse 1, the ethnic tension between the Jews and the Moabite. So you can see there is subliminal hating going on here. He doubles up on the Moabite. And the second of all, he knows all that, had a conversation with her, and he doesn't know her name. He could have just said, that's Ruth, Naomi's daughter-in-law. But instead, he's trying to pervert Boaz's perspective of her. But I love the next verse. It says this, eight. So Boaz said to Ruth. Boaz just turns and starts having a conversation with her, which teaches us powerfully that favor will not allow the perspective of someone who is essential to your God-ordained purpose to be perverted before they have the chance to connect with you. Come on. And he says to her, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Any relationship that is God-ordained or essential to you fulfilling your purpose is a relationship where the person's perspective of you will not be allowed to be perverted before they have the chance to connect with you. Favor is at work. Boaz continued and said to Ruth, Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled which shows us that favor will make sure that you have a place that you are protected and that you are provided for. Favor will allow you to drink from jars that you didn't fill. Hello? (laughs) Yes. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground and asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father, your mother, your homeland, and came to live with a people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. You see, God sent Naomi to Moab to pick up Ruth. Favor made sure that she ended up at the right field at the right time with the right person. Favor made sure that she gained the attention and won the affection of the right person. Favor made sure that she had a place, that she had protection, and she had provision. And the story goes on to say that this divine providential meeting between Ruth and Boaz went on to become a relationship, a relationship that culminated in a marriage. A marriage that produced a child whose name was Obed. And this child grew up to be the father of Jesse, who in turn grew up to become the father of a boy who killed a giant named Goliath. And this boy, David, went on to become the greatest king in Israel's history. And this king ended up being the great, 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 great great-grandfather of Jesus Christ. So Ruth called the Moabite. Ruth called the widow. Ruth called the foreigner. Ruth's personal assistant, Favor, was working on her behalf to make sure that she got to the right place at the right time with the right people in order to fulfill her purpose, which was to bring a Savior into the world. So it doesn't matter how people have seen you in the past. It doesn't matter how people label you currently. If you will lay hold of this supernatural grace that is being extended to you called favor, you will find yourself in more and more moments of convergence through favor expectancy, finding yourself at the right place at the right time with the right people in order to accomplish what it is that he wants you to do. I'm going to leave you with Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, which says this, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. So I simply want to encourage you, church, and then I'm going to release an impartation. I want to encourage you to check your heart. Is that John Christ always says that? Check your heart. Comedian? Anyway. Check your heart and see, okay, where is it that I am operating in mercy and in truth? Where is an opportunity in my life right now that I can extend mercy to someone? 
What is a truth that I am aware of that I am not aligned with, and how can I shift into that? And in doing those two things, you are cooperating with the principle that unlocks favor in your life. And then if you want that to increase, all you have to do is partner your faith with the expectation that that's going to happen, that that's going to manifest. Make sense? All right. So go ahead and stand up with me. And uh, I'm going to lead you in a declaration over yourself. And I'm going to be intentionally imparting what I've earned and learned and inherited in the area of favor to you guys as we make this royal declaration. So just repeat this after me. Let it be known that I am a much-loved child of God. I am a royal king walking the earth. Favor is upon me and for me. Working on my behalf to put me where I need to be, when I need to be there, with who I need to be with, in order to accomplish my purpose on earth. I will operate with mercy and truth, and I will engage my faith by expecting favor encounters every day of my life. Let this be so. All right, Court Church, you guys have been amazing. Thanks for having me. Good times. Hold on up here. Hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. This is good stuff. Amen? Amen. Yeah? Um, Well, I'm excited about even more future stuff. We're going to walk in favor, but we're going to have this guy back multiple times. We're going to steal him from SOKP, right? Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> um, would you do me a favor? We just want to bless this guy. Would you just extend your hand out this way? And uh, me and Father, I, I thank you for the privilege and the honor that we've had uh, to just, just walk with Dub hand in hand. He's just an amazing uh, individual, just a, a great son of you, but he's an amazing friend, a great teacher, a great mentor. And uh, man, he has walked out this message he just shared about favor. So right here today, um, I love what so, uh, Isaiah 61 talks about, a double portion, a double anointing. And, you know, Lord, whether all the um, theology around that, whatever that is, Lord, I just speak that over him. I just take those words out of Isaiah 61, and we just speak a double anointing over him. Double honor, Father, as he is a city rebuilder and a people uh, builder, Father God. I just thank you for what you've done in him. And we as Core Church, we bless him. We pray for Beth. Man, God, uh, just to, to bring the kingdom uh, so powerfully in a classroom uh, with with kids, Lord. It's so beautiful. So we just ask that you give her supernatural wisdom uh, to increase that level of kingdom that she releases. We we pray that, God, that she would have vision of, of how to take that to another level. And, Lord, we pray for that whole school to be enveloped with the kingdom, Father God, uh, all because of her classroom, Lord. And for Cinda, man, Lord, we just bless that amazing little girl, Lord. We ask that you continue to just wash over his whole family. And, uh, God, we thank you for what you've done. Thank you for him being here. We pray for safe travels as he continues on the road. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Yeah. 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 Too, man. Woo! All right, everybody. Um, man, I don't know. Uh, like Raquel said, look at the announcements. I don't know. <laughs> right? Yeah. Put them on the screen. We'll get with Lydia. That's Lydia's fault. Is that what it is? No, just kidding. I'm just joking. <clears throat> so um, we do have some other things coming up, though, uh, that are going to be pretty powerful, uh, pretty cool. But in the meantime, man, go enjoy the day. Uh, get up here, get a quick handshake or a hug uh, if you want from Dub. Um, and um, there's something else I was supposed to mention, I don't remember. But anyway. Oh, uh, so HCA is packing up bag stuff for the, their uh, night out. I think that's this Friday. So if you, if you want anything on that, go see Zoe, okay? And uh, she'll square you away. But, uh, man, he's just good, Amen. So let's walk in favor, yeah? Yeah? Man, Lord, I just bless every, every aspect of us being here today. Uh, every word that we've heard, 
every, uh, man, I love those little revelation moments that you give, Father. And uh, I pray that uh, that those were, we know they were written on our heart as we heard them and, and that, that's just infused in us. But Lord, I pray that you would bring them to our recollection uh, when we're at the stoplight or when we're in that grocery store and it's that, it's that person and that is uh, being that guy. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to remember the favor that's on us, to let, help us to uh, have that vision, Lord God, that we are simply your favored sons and daughters. Man, we love you, Father, so much. We give you all glory and all the honor, God, that we can today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Listen, if you need specific prayer for something specific, uh, then please just jump up here to Raquel and I, and uh, we'll be glad to chat with you for a minute. Uh, There's some people on Zoom. Uh, Hey, we love you guys. If you need something, just give us something in the chat right there. And uh, we'll help. We'll uh, see what we can do. Man, we love you all. God bless. Be safe.